I'm going to do today is going to spend a few minutes discussing how we've integrated the uh, intelligent data within the FactSet workstation. So I'm going to hit on a few locations. Um, first, we're going to start off with universal screening. Then we're going to talk about portfolio analytics, and we're going to show you how intelligence scores look in combination with um, you know, a portfolio and a benchmark. And then what we'll do is we'll wrap up in alpha testing where we show um, an alpha generation use case using intelligence data. Um, so I'm going to start here in universal screening. And so this is a widely used application on FactSet. And um, the, one, of the, one of the main use cases that we see clients use it for is investment due diligence. So if you think about buy side managers um, taking a look at sort of a larger universe and using criteria to kind of narrow it down, um, what we've done in this particular screen is we've looked, we're looking at uh, a broad based index, in this case, the MSCI Europe. And we're, we're bringing in information, both um, fundamental information as well as intelligence, uh, climate transition risk information. And so in this particular screen, um, we have, uh, we've grouped this by the RIBIX taxonomy, the sector taxonomy. So we can see both sector level positioning as well as individual securities. And so I've expanded under energy and I'm just gonna kind of step through some of the column criteria that we've put in here. Um, of course, you can see just general market information, closing price, sales, um, and then as we move over to the right, what you can see is we've brought in the scenarios um, for the, the carbon adjusted T-risk score for the net zero, which is uh, the most stringent of the, of the scenarios that Intelligent provides. Um, and then alongside those, we have the new T-ratio score. And so I'll, I'll do a little explanation as we um, go along here. So the first column here, um, this is a quartile score. So Intelligent provides facts at the score um, in a, a zero, one, two, three. Uh, and so what we've done here, and, and lower is better in this case, I just want to clarify that. So um, lower, what zeros would be your leaders, threes would be your laggards. And so we use screening in this case to sort of narrow down on the top two quartiles using this particular scenario. Um, again, this is using the net zero 2050 scenario. Uh, and so, and then when we've done across the, um, the different, uh, you know, the different sectors as we've, we've averaged out the scores. Um, when we move over here to the right, what we're doing is we're actually comparing the new T ratio score, which is effectively the, the return of the current policy as a percentage of the return alternative. Um, and so this actually is a, is a nice way to compare both at the sector level and the security level. Um, it gives some dispersion for an individual securities. And, and again, in this case, the lower scores are better. So you can see in particular for particular companies, um, you know, what security performs better under a particular scenario. And then it may, in fact, you know, to make you want to choose a particular uh, scenario due to the way that it's performing. Um, and then over to our right here, we have some traditional carbon analytics scores, um, you know, carbon footprint and intensity. Those would be PAIs two and three. And so as we talk about this from a regulatory perspective, I think these scores sort of go, the, the intelligence scores go hand in hand, uh, especially as we think about, um, we should just mention Article 8 and Article 9 funds. And we think about the KPIs that managers have to choose to, to evaluate those funds. So, um, you know, we typically see things like carbon footprint and intensity, but when we, we kind of go outside of the, the traditional company report and metrics, we, um, you know, we can introduce the scenarios and scores that we, we get from Intelligent, uh, you know, that give us, give us a tremendous amount of granularity uh, and also have sort of a more of a real-time nature as we're getting these scores uh, quarterly. So with that, I'm going to jump into portfolio analysis, and we're going to take a look at a couple more reports that we've created there. Um, again, you know, focusing on this from a regulatory perspective, what we've done in this particular report, and just uh, let me step back here a second, we're, um, we're comparing, in this case, the MSCI World Climate Transition ETF, which is um, the, the fund that, that Pooja mentioned earlier, and we're comparing it to the MSCI World. And so uh, this particular report, is looking at this from a bench portfolio benchmark relative perspective. And so we can see the composition of our portfolio and our benchmark um, active just being where we have overweights, underweights. But, but we are, again, are bringing in um, overall level of emissions. So think, you know, uh, PAI is one and then, uh, and then footprint and, and so forth for PAI two. Um, and we're doing this sort of a, a, a benchmark comparison, right? So we can see what the portfolio looks like, what the benchmark looks like 
Also, what does it look like from a footprint perspective? And then marry that alongside with intelligence data. And so in this case, we're actually bringing in their unadjusted scores, which can range below zero to, to above zero. Uh, again, the lower the score, the better. So we can see what this looks like for um, a below two degree scenario for the unadjusted score, uh, as we're looking at this from a weighted average perspective. And then again, using the, uh, the actual quartile score, where that's then normalized and, and provided a score from a, a zero, one, two, three perspective. So we can see that the climate transition fund is um, has both a, a, a lower footprint um, from a company reported perspective, as well as lower uh, carbon T risk carbon adjusted score relative to the index. Um, and so one of the things that you can do now with intelligent data, because we have a deep time series information, is we can take uh, take some of this information and then we can we can chart this historically over time. And so what we, we have in the, the below chart here is we're taking a look at the footprint uh, for which is the blue bar and for the portfolio and the green being the MSCI world. And we're doing that comparison over time. Um, and so we've we've actually we're looking at this over the course of the, the history for the ETF. Uh, and what you can see is that um, the, the, the ETF has has far lower of a footprint throughout time. And then as we actually bring alongside the carbon adjusted score, the T-risk score, we can see that the same thing is true um, that we're seeing there as well. We're seeing the spread between the, the, the top, uh, the pink line being more the, um, the benchmark and the, and the orange line is, is the portfolio. So you get a sense um, how this looks like over time. And the other thing that we can do here is, is we can actually bring in different sectors. So we're looking at this at the overall total level. Um, but if we wanted to say drill into a more um, carbon intensive industry, we can see what the deltas look like there. Um, and that there's been actually some convergence as we've in, in the more recent years uh, with the score. So this is this gives you a really good perspective as to how, you know, from a footprint perspective, as well as using intelligence scoring, um, what this, the risk looks like from the, the, the portfolio versus the benchmark. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on some of the charts that Pooja showed. She did go into a little bit of detail already, but We've provided, um, we, we've created contribution reports, again, using the MSCI World Climate Transition. Um, and what we've done is we've looked at quarterly performance over the last uh, seven or so years, and we've split out the leaders versus the laggards. And so what we've done is we've, we've basically textualized the numerical values, um, the quartile values into leader, innovator, follower, and laggard. And then what we wanted to do is track that over time. So we can take a look at our leaders, um, our best performers versus our laggards. And you can see pretty much as I'm gonna click through these in, in all of the different scenarios that we are achieving outperformance. Now, Pooja did touch upon the, the below two degree scenario, which is obviously a, a more stringent scenario. And we do show the inversion, um, you know, the, the, in 2022, the sort of anti-transition year where there's more of a reliance on fossil fuel, there was the war in Ukraine. Um, so we do see how the scenarios are reacting um, and, and the performance of the leader bucket is, a, is actually flip-flop with the laggard bucket. Um, but that, you know, again, we can, we can display each one of these scenarios and get a particular view on how they perform over time. Um, and, you know, you, you obviously can test this out through uh, looking at different types of funds. This is obviously a, already a, a climate focused fund, but you could look at this for, um, you know, the overall MSCI world or uh, the ACWI, for example, that it incorporates emerging as well. So that's just the perspective from the, the return perspective. Uh, I want to also touch upon how the intelligent data can be used um, in the use case for performance attribution. So we talked a little bit about how it can be used for SFDR and how it fits alongside of the principal adverse impacts. Um, we took a look a bit, took a look at how, how it looks within a contribution perspective. Now we're using performance attribution to actually measure what the, the climate transition ETF looks like versus the MSCI world from a, from a um, uh, attribution analysis perspective. And so what we're doing here is we're actually using the, uh, the climate, the T-risk carbon adjusted score, bucketing the portfolio and the index by leader, innovator, follower, laggard. And what we can see is that the bulk of the, the climate transition uh, fund is, is, in, is in the leader category. Um, we can also see as we look at the performance that it's uh, it performed extremely well and it almost perfectly in step as we, as we look at the categories 
Um, again, we can see laggards, um, that performance is, is looking a little bit higher. I think that's primarily due to the more recent time periods where um, there has been a little bit more of a fossil fuel reliance and we've seen some of the laggards uh, perform. But as we look at this, we can get a sense as to how this performs for some broad based index using attribution analysis. Uh, and if we take a look at the leader category, for example, we actually have a slight overweight and we did outperform. And so when we look at the overall benchmark performance from the leader category and compare it to the overall performance, there's, there's not performance. And so we're seeing a benefit from an allocation perspective. Um, same thing with selection. So we did, a, we did a nice job of picking securities within the leader category as it's relative to the index and are seeing um, you know, additional performance coming from a selection perspective. So this is one view. This is obviously one ETF versus the MSCI world. Uh, you know, if you're if there's a you're managing a portfolio, you could do a similar type analysis. But this can be helpful in, in helping to understand what this looks like from the perspective of, of climate risk. Um, you know, and this could be something that can be bucketed in conjunction with you know traditional uh, sector or region categorization. But uh, I wanted to share with you how we could look at this through the lens of performance attribution with with intelligent. And then one more report in the attribution space, and this is actually looking at a Brinson model, what is opposed to using financial performance, we're actually taking a look at overall levels of emissions. Um, so similar setup to the prior report, yet now we're, as opposed to decomposing financial performance, we're looking at overall levels of scope one and two emissions. Um, and so we basically are, are using that as the way to decompose the performance. Uh, and so no surprise when we look at the leader category, it's the lightest area of emissions um, and in the portfolio is, is doing even a slightly better job uh, as we can see from both an allocation and selection perspective. Um, but I point the attention actually to the laggard bucket here as we take a look at this as there's a significant underweight 2% um, of the portfolio versus five. And even in that particular bucket, there's a lot, there's a, a lot lower level of scope one and two emissions relative to the index. And we see that from this active value. And so that was definitely a benefit, not only from an allocation perspective, but from selection. So again, just another way of showing how you can compare a portfolio relative to an index. Um, in this case, where again, we're using overall level emissions, you could, you could do something with like carbon intensity as well. And then how it, how it fits in conjunction with the intelligent uh, T-risk carbon adjusted scores. Uh, last but not least, what I wanted to do is to touch upon the alpha generation use case. So Faxit has a tool called alpha testing, and it's primarily used for, for back testing capabilities. So clients will take a look at deep history data sets such as intelligent, and they'll, they'll test for performance. And so what we've done in this particular model is we've take a look, we've, we're taking a look at the MSCI all country world. So in this case, we're incorporating the, um, the emerging component. Um, and so we have both developed and emerging, and we're taking a look at historical performance over a 10 plus year back test. And we're analyzing the excess return to the benchmark. And so the benchmark being the uh, all country world. And so what we can see here is when we quintile scores, we actually have sort of an in-step uh, view of the excess return where quintiles one and two outperform um, and the quintiles four and five underperform, which, which makes sense relative to the overall index. And we're looking at this both from a uh, equal weighted as well as a market value weighted. And we actually see uh, quite a higher performance when we look at um, the market value weighted uh, view. And so this is just one view. There's a million different ways that you can incorporate um, the data set. In fact, you know, some clients would want to take this data and actually combine it with traditional fundamental factors. So you could do something like that and combine it with, um, you know, uh, you know, your, your traditional fundamental factors and then see um, how that looks in conjunction with those factors uh, and, and can conduct a back test that way as well.